And that is all. So I'm going to let Gina um, introduce herself and take it away. Sure. So I'm Gina Fernandez. I'm a, a professor at NC State University. I have responsibilities in blackberry, raspberry, and strawberry breeding, as well as blackberry. Oops. Oh, yep, I am unmuted. And um, caneberry extension. And I've been here for 25 years this month. It's amazing how quickly time goes. All right, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. And come on. There we go. So everybody see the big screen? Yes. Okay. And hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great. Good deal. Okay, so we're going to talk about blackberry varieties and growing tips. And I only have like a half hour, so this is very, going to be a very quick overview of um, all of things blackberry, um, mostly for small and mid-sized growers, um, because I don't think there's any large marketers in Durham County. Um, so blackberries are nutritious. You know, they're one of the, the new up and coming berry crops that's good for you. Um, lots of vitamin C in it. And the thing about blackberries is that they're adapted to the southeastern United States and they fit in a nice window here. If you look at this, the availability year round, most in, and if you go into the grocery store now in any time in the winter, when I was a child, you couldn't get blackberries in the wintertime, but now you can. So um, blackberries available pretty much all year round. They come in at the wintertime during um, January, February, March, either from Chile or Mexico. Um, and then again, in later in the season as well in the, the fall and winter. Uh, in the summer, they come in from Oregon and, and California, and the more, most of the Oregon production is actually um, uh, processing blackberries, so really doesn't count for fresh market. But we fit into this nice little niche here in the southeastern United States where we have blackberries from June, July, August, um, can go up into September as well, depending on location within the state. So we have a really nice niche where and, and the, the availability is not as high and the prices are pretty good. So it's a really nice little niche that we fit into here in the Southeastern United States. All right, next. So I wanna just give you a little bit more background information. Um, this past year, 2020, the North American Blackberry Raspberry Growers Association did a marketing survey throughout the country and asked the, the uh, growers a couple of questions. And they divided up the country into different regions. Um, you can see those regions right there, Canada, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, Midwest, and Northeast. <clears throat> and then the Southeast were highlighted there. And they asked them what type of marketing, um, how do they market their blackberries? And you can see here the farm stand, most of the 28% uh, were uh, blackberry growers market by farm stand. You pick is 44%, which I was really surprised because it's hot down here and it's hot to time of year to pick blackberries, but quite a few do you pick. Farmers market about 20% wholesale. The smaller wholesale is about 12%. The large wholesale, which is the you know, majority of the industry in our state, um, and this includes other states within the Southeast, is uh, about 24%. And then a little bit of processing and a little bit of other, but that just kind of gives you an idea of what's going on with the Blackberry market. And then I thought this would be particularly interesting for you guys. Um, in the Southeastern United States, the price per pound of Blackberries at a farm stand was about a little bit over five and a half dollars. You pick $4, farmer's markets almost $8, Wholesale three and a half dollars, uh, uh, depending on um, a smaller wholesaler, and then a larger wholesaler five point six three dollars. Um, a processor only a dollar fifty, um, and then other, which are other types of unique and, and niche markets as well. Um, they can get quite a bit of money from them. So that's just kind of give you an idea. We don't do a whole lot of raspberries in the southeast, so I'm just going to skip through those. Um, they're just not adapted, so we're not going to talk about them too much. Okay. A little bit about the blackberry industry in North Carolina. When I started here about 25 years ago, there was maybe 100 acres. Um, in 2006, it was a kind of a change in the whole market. A company called Sunny Ridge, which doesn't exist anymore, made um, uh, developed a lot of contracts with several growers in the western part of the state. Can you see my arrow here? Let me see. Yes, we can actually. I'll, I'll turn on the laser here. Um, Oops, it didn't go on. 
it's not going on anyways. Okay, so with, um, but um, in the western part of the state over here, um, in this, the, uh, like the, the, the foothills and then up in the mountains themselves. Um, so that, that industry has grown. It's probably somewhere between 800 and 1,000 acres now. Um, there's a whole lot of acreage going down in the eastern part of the state uh, in the last couple of years. Um, most of the varieties are the Arkansas varieties. So, you know, Shawnee, Kiowa, Wachita, things like that. Um, and we'll talk about those varieties in a little bit. Um, and some of the larger marketers in the, in the, in the uh, state are companies called North Bay, Nature Ripe, Driscoll's, Wish Farms. So you see those when you pick up those clamshells. Um, so you can know that part of the time in the, in the summer that those berries are coming from North Carolina. Um, like I said, most of the commercial industries in the western part of the state here, and a new, new industry developing in the eastern part of the state. Um, but this heat map represents, um, I did a survey with growers or blackberry or agents about a year ago and asked them how many acres they had in their counties. And the lighter purple um, indicate counties with less than 10 acres, and the darker blue um, indicate counties with more than 10 acres. So that, you know, collectively, maybe there are two or three growers that had a couple of acres each. Um, in the counties where there's more than 10 acres, it's usually several large growers with well over uh, 10 acres. All right, so we're going to jump into a little bit about the plant itself. The blackberry plant is a perennial plant. It has a perennial root system. The above ground growth is um, biennial. That means it has a two-year growth cycle. The first year, the canes, new canes develop or emerge from the crown. And in the second year, the canes produce fruit and then they die. So it's sort of like an onion um, that has that biennial uh, growth habit. By giving some background information on blackberries and then describing the process. Uh oh. Traditionally, <laughs> blackberries. Sorry about this. There's somebody else talking in the background for just this slide. But this gives you the, the growth habit of this blackberry cropping system. And I'm going to just drop, jump to the next one. Sorry about that. It covers it here as well. So the blackberry plant, there are two types um, of fruiting. Um, on that biennial cane. So they, the ones that produce the fruit on the second year cane are called flora canes. They um, are the most popular blackberries that we have in the state. Um, and uh, they flower in the spring and then they fruit in the early summer. And that's a kind of a schematic of that plant is right here. The first year, those canes are just vegetative and they don't produce any fruit. However, there's new types of primocane fruiting or new types of blackberries called primocane fruiting blackberries where they produce fruit uh, on the first year growth, right? Um, on those canes that emerge from the crown in the first year, they flower in midsummer and they fruit in the early fall. Um, they can be managed um, with selective fruiting to fruit both in the, in the fall and in the spring. So you could have like a, they call, it's called double cropping. However, for most of North Carolina, um, there's uh, floral development is really reduced when the temperatures get between 80 or, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> when the temperatures get over 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's flower buds just don't develop. So it's really a challenge to get um, fruit, fruit and flowers developing um, in those primocane fruiting types. I apologize. My, my husband just came home and the dogs are very excited. All right. So that's a little bit about the biology. Um, we're going to talk about cultivars next. There's Blackberries are not all this equal. There's lots of different shapes and sizes. Certainly the color is all the same, but they are really, they range a lot in um, uh, tastes and shapes and sizes. So there are floricane fruiting blackberries. There are several of them out there and these are the most popular ones. If I was a small or mid-sized grower, there's one variety that I would, that um, if I was going to plant just one variety, it would be Wachita. Doesn't sound like, uh, the pronunciation is, doesn't, isn't what it looks like right there. So it's Wachita. Um, all the other ones, we're going to talk about um, a few of the newer ones late, uh, that a uh, little bit later on, but Wachita is the one that I would suggest for um, if you're going to only plant one. Wachita is floricane fruiting. It's thornless, pronounced Wachita. It's the standard in North Carolina and pretty much everywhere in the world. There's a lot of those planted. It's very reliable. It needs 400 to 500 hours chilling, which we get about 800 hours here in, in the Piedmont area of North Carolina. So it gets the sufficient chilling each year. Um, 
it's just very cons consistent production each year and it doesn't break buds really early so we don't get a lot of frost damage on that. Um, it has excellent shipping capability and black, uh, the uh, Wachita really tastes good, shiny black. So usually they're picked for um, shipping shiny black and they taste good. Some of the earlier varieties when they ship or they were picked shiny black, they're not quite as good. So shiny black is, uh, is something you see when you're going in the field and they look nice and shiny. It's like, it it's, looks like it's ready to be picked. However, if you really want a good flavored blackberry, you wait another day till it gets dull black and that's much um, tastier. But for commercial purposes, it, um, you pick a shiny black and, <clears throat> and you can and sell it well. Uh, it sells well um, either, either way. Vaughn is another blackberry variety. It's actually developed from here at North Carolina State University. It's also a floricane fruiting. It's thornless. So all the varieties I'm recommending are thornless, which is important. Um, it's a clean plant. It's highly resistant to a lot of diseases that we see, especially orange rust. And I see a lot of orange rust in uh, the Piedmont and Sand Hills area. So um, it does really well in this area. Really high yields, medium, it's a medium sized fruit. It's not one of the bigger ones, but it's medium size um, is, is very um, palatable. I don't, I think sometimes the larger berries, you have to take two bites. I like a blackberry that you can just um, pop in your mouth and have it uh, one bite only. Um, it's a later season um, variety. So the average harvest is about the third week of June. Um, and then it goes into July, maybe the th first week of August. So if you want to plant two varieties, I would plant um, Wachita and Vaughn. Um, growers in the western part of the state like this one a lot because it really ripens just at a nice time when um, uh, prices are high for them. Ponca is a newer variety from the University of Arkansas program. Again, it's floricane fruiting thornless. It has really nice plant health. It's uh, floricane and primocane leaves. I really have a dark green color, so it looks a little different than a lot of the other varieties from that program. Um, it can produce a secondary bud crop. Uh, so on the primocanes there as well, not a whole lot. It ripens 14 to 20 days after the primary crop. So there, it starts harvest, so it can kind of extend your harvest. And the cool thing about Ponca is that it has kind of a really shortened stature. The internode length is often shorter. So it, it would fit into a, like even a backyard uh, setting really nicely. Um, and we're hoping that maybe we don't have to prune it and, and pinch it or tip it back as much. But that's to be determined as we get to know this variety a little bit more. Cato, Cato is uh, another variety pretty new from the University of Arkansas breeding program. Um, it's harvested between Natchez, which is a, one of the earliest varieties, um, and Osage. Uh, so it's sort of early to mid season, got great plant health. The floricane and primocane leaves are usually clean. They got that nice deeper green color. Uh, flavor is a key attribute of this one. It has great aromatics and about 10% or more soluble sugars, that sweetness. So it's a really sweet berry and it really does well in storage. So you can see how big that, that uh, berry is too, you know, more than two fingers wide. All right, so now we're gonna move on to primocane fruiting cultivars. And if I was to plant just one primocane fruiting cultivar in my um, uh, small fruit planting, I would plant Prime Arc Freedom. The reason of that is it's thornless. Um, and, and if you've ever dealt with picking blackberries from the wild, you did not want to go back and have thorny type of variety of blackberries. All these other Primark varieties um, do have thorns um, and they all will struggle with producing a, a fruit on that first primocane, uh, that, the primocane crop. So um, if you're going to plant one, I would just play with, uh, with freedom. Uh, the other ones uh, uh, have thorns. Freedom is the floricane crop though. So if you want to uh, uh, leave it in for two years, you can get that floricane crop and it ripens um, really, really early. So you can start, if you want something really early, you could do freedom. Mid season would be Wachita, late season would be Vaughn. Um, if you, you want to go that way. Um, the primocane crop will probably be mid July, but you get just a smattering of fruit. So I wouldn't really produce it for that primocane crop. Um, the primocane berries can be up to 16 grams, which um, I think the, there's not a picture of this here, but it's really probably one of the larger berries coming out of that program. Um, it is intended for the home garden or local market use only. So I think it has a nice little niche there. Um, and it is thor thornless, which is really, really nice for this um, crop. 
Primark Horizon is a new variety from that breeding program as well. So I just wanted to throw it in here because it's the newest um, of the releases there. It's thorny as all heck, but it, it's, they say that it's reduced thorns compared to other ones. So it's about 45% less thorns. Um, but if you've ever seen the thorns and blackberries, it's still pretty thorny. Um, it can be a complement to one of their other uh, varieties, Primark 45. So it's about the same period of time of ripening. Um, it has a huge floricane cropping potential. So if you wanted to produce it on that second year cane and hold it over, it can produce a lot, but still it's got the thorns. Um, and then in the, in the areas where they can produce on primate canes, it has a pretty large potential larger than the Primark 45. And again, the berries are just humongous. Okay, going to go over site selection and preparation just really quickly here. There's, I'll set, uh, I've got some resources at the end that we can talk about. I just want to uh, plant a few seeds here so we can start thinking about what you might need. Here is an example of a planting we'll put on uh, um, some sort of uh, landscape fabric or mulch, um, things you need to think about as well as, um, you know, how wide you want your rows, you want to think about cultivars, what type of trellis, when and how to plant. So we're not going to go over all of these, but I'll, I'll show you, point you in the right direction where you can get um, all of that information. Uh, how many plants would you want to plant? Uh, the average yield per plant of the erect type, which is all the, all the types that we're talking about today, somewhere between 12 and 15 pounds per plant. So if you're a backyard gardener and you have three plants, you're going to have 45 pounds of blackberries, which is enough, I think, for yourself and probably all your neighbors as well. Um, if you're thinking about pick your own or a farm stand, you know, that I would think maybe somewhere between 25, 50 plants would be a good place to start. As far as sites and soils, you want a nice sunny location. They really aren't shade tolerant. Um, you want to have uh, sandy loam is the ideal soil, but I know a lot of us don't have that um, east of or west of Raleigh. Um, you're going to need irrigation with uh, either the sandy soils or the heavy soils. With the heavy soils, you want to make sure that you have some good drainage um, and also consider doing some raised beds, the type of raised beds that um, like the strawberry growers used. It doesn't have to be too raised, but um, maybe three, uh, three to six inches, something like that. Um, you want a pH of about 5.5 to 6.5 and closer to six is better. 5.5 is a push in it. That's a little bit low and some moderate fertility would be great as well. You want to plant in the spring or the fall. Um, I like actually planting in the fall because the plants are, and, and if you're thinking about it now, it'd be a good time to set everything else in place for you to get ready for fall planting. Um, when you plant in the fall, you allow that plant to get established, the root system get established in the, in the cooler temperatures so it doesn't have to produce both leaves and roots as it goes into the summer if you plant in the spring. So it really um, gets you off to a better start if you plant in the fall. I really like planting plug plants. Um, there is a local company here in, um, in North Carolina that now produces plug plants. <clears throat> And uh, you know, that's a nicer way to go make sure they're from tissue culture uh, because we have a lot of problems with viruses in plants. So make sure that they're nice clean plants. Um, I really do not like bare root or root pieces because those are usually um, plants that have been growing out in the field for a long time and they accumulate um, diseases, especially viruses. Uh, if you're gonna buy some plants at like uh, the local Lowe's or Home Depot's, be careful there. Um, they're usually nice plants. They charge you a whole lot of money. Um, but oftentimes they're either off type. I've seen um, thorny varieties listed with thornless variety names on them. So not a real fan of those types, but um, they are nice blackberries. Um, they're, you know, they're nice healthy blackberries when you buy them. Um, and then some other local nurseries that specialize in smaller amounts of plants too. And I'm gonna, I think I have a link at the end here too, where um, you can get plants from both locally and uh, mail order. Planting, you usually want to plant about three to four feet between the plants um, and then eight to 12 feet between the rows. Um, and then you want to try to tie your canes to the trellis the first year. Not everybody gets those trellises up, but it's really good if you can. And this just sort of illustrates the different, how the planting, the plants fill in that space as they grow um, and they will fill up that space, believe me. 
I like a V trellis if at all possible. Um, it allows for, um, especially if you're gonna do some sort of pick your own operation, it allows for separation of the fruiting part of the cane. They will be on the outside of the cane and the new growth would come up in the, uh, in the middle portion of the cane. So you have the separation of the fruiting portion of the canopy, which would be on the outside. You train it that way. And then the new growth would come up from the root system in between and you have um, them separated, which works well during harvest, especially. Uh, going to talk about pruning and training really briefly. This is time of the year to do the pruning. We're getting sort of to the edge of the first to second week of March is the latest we want to do because you would start to see the buds break on the blackberries. Um, but oftentimes we would have uh, pruning and train or training pruning uh, workshops this time of year. So maybe next year we'll be able to get outside and do a workshop um, around here and, and show you firsthand how to do it. But this is what, what the blackberry plant would look like this time of year. You can see the <clears throat> all the brown canes are this coming year's fruiting canes. The canes that are kind of white or gray are the ones that need to be cut out because um, they fruit, produced fruit last year and they are dead. So some objectives of pruning and training, you can look here, this is a really dense canopy right here. This is a, at one of the research stations, way too much um, canes in that, that system. So this is before um, pruning took place in that plot. Um, so you wanna, first of all, remove the dead and diseased canes because they don't produce any fruit. Um, you wanna open up that canopy. Uh, you wanna increase the size and yield of your fruit. If you have too many canes in there, they'll just overcrop and you'll get small black fruit. Um, and you want to make sure that you have that fruit evenly distributed from the ground to the top of the canopy so you have a full uh, plane of picking um, by positioning those canes uh, throughout, uh, low, throughout the canopy. And there are pruning and training um, uh, sessions or times of the year. You need to do it both in the winter and the summer. So it's not just a winter thing. There is some pruning in the summer as well. But just want to show you what we do in the winter. This is a schematic, if you look at this little diagram right here of winter uh, dormant pruning. So that's what the plant, the previous plant looked like right there. You can see it's lots of canes, lots of long laterals and lots of branches. Um, this is before pruning and this is after. So what you wanna do is select three to seven healthy canes. And this is four canes right here. This is just to make it easier there. Um, and these would be the floor canes that you leave. You want to prune the tops to about 45 to 50 uh, inches. So right at a little bit above that top wire right there. And you want to prune all your laterals from about 12 to 18 inches. You can see kind of the ghost of what was pruned off of all these canes. So you can uh, see there's a whole lot less here. Probably 50% of the canes <coughs> have been pruned out there. Uh, this is another, just an illustration of an individual cane that you wanna prune out those laterals to 12 to 18 inches there. If you wanna watch a nice video, I have a YouTube video that we made last spring, just a few days before a lockdown at a, a local grower's farm right here. Um, it explains the steps of pruning in the winter. Um, I think you probably can just Google Gina Fernandez blackberry pruning and you can come up with this video here and that will take you through all the steps. You also, want, I want to mention a little bit about summer tipping. It's also important to maximize your yield. Um, when you tip in the summer, it forces the, the, the next year's canes to do some lateral branches so you get more surface area. Um, and you also want to maintain that height there. You can see that grower in the lower panel there. Um, he's, he's, he is a very tall man and he's tipping it. So he and all the, the pickers next year have a, uh, a plant that is, they can reach, they can reach all the fruit that they pick there. Um, it can be pruned and tipped until throughout the summer, um, at least one time more is better. Um, and there is a video uh, <laughs> to look and to see how they're tipping and there's a link at the end of this talk to the, that video. Um, at the end of summer, so this is the tipping, you tip the primocanes right here. And then at the end of summer, once the floricanes have produced the fruit, you want to remove those bent canes. Um, you might, those canes are brown. You can see that the fruit um, remnants are still on those laterals. And you want to cut that to the ground level and get them out of the way so you improve the air circulation within that canopy. 
Um, there is a nice little product publication uh, that we developed at NC State Blackberries for the home garden. If you want a really small, um, how to produce them in a small scale, just Google blackberries for the home garden NCSU and you should be able to find them. And it goes through all the different steps of oops, uh, producing blackberries. But I could scroll through that one. Now here is a, a link to a nursery list that is produced by the North American Blackberry and Raspberry Growers Association. Um, just Google NARBA nursery list and it will give you this list. And this is just the first page of, um, I think it's two page publication. And it gives you the nursery itself, the type of the blackberry cultivars they have um, and what type they have, other um, offerings that they might have. And then what type of plants do they have? Tissue culture plants, pug, potted plants, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, that's a really good resource for you. Um, Norse farms, I know in particular, will sell smaller numbers of plants. I'm not sure about all the other nurseries here. Most of them like larger orders. Um, but make sure that you ask if they have clean plants that have been um, virus tested and have recently been in tissue culture. Here are some resources for um, um, blackberry production, the Southern Region Small Fruit Consortium. Um, there's a website there, smallfruits.org. There's newsletters. There's, we have lists of chores to do on a quarterly um, basis. There's a production guide. There's IPM spray guides that are updated every year. Um, there's a blackberry and raspberry portal at NC State that has lots of information on production. Um, yield data, post-harvest data, so a lot of information on uh, that you, uh, and, and pest management as well. Um, there's Team Rubus blog. It's a blog that I uh, uh, have written. Um, it talks about timely things like when we have a freeze, what has happening out there. So that is out there for you to look at. Um, we also have social media, Facebook and Twitter are available there. There is, if you want a really in-depth information, um, there the University of Arkansas, I think it was last year. Yeah, last year in 2009, oh, oh, 2017. Oh my gosh, it's more than last year. Um, it put together a four series webinar going through the different stages of production of blackberries. So there's in the winter, um, in the basics of blackberry production, fairly in-depth. So these are available. There's 13 recorded talks, four how-to videos. So it's a really nice resource. Um, it's, are the native thorny blackberry brambles that we see everywhere as weeds, are they native? And are they the same base species as these commercial varieties? And do they cause any pro potential problems if they cross pollinate with your crop? Um, lots of questions there. So um, the native ones, yeah, there's some, there's a couple of different species out there. Um, they, 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 they do well, they, um, uh, uh, do they, let me see, what was the other question? Do they cause any problems? Yes, they do. I, one of the recommendations for growing blackberries is to remove all wild brambles from 600 feet from any commercial production. So you don't want to have them um, as um, sources of diseases. There's lots of diseases out there, cane blight, <coughs> orange rust, um, um, and viruses can get transmitted from insects from those, uh, those um, wild plants around uh, the, the periphery of your commercial planting. Um, can they cross pollinate? That doesn't do it. That doesn't matter if they cross pollinate your plant. You're, it's not going to change what your blackberry variety looks like, um, and it will produce uh, the true to type what it's always produced. It's clonally propagated. It's self fertile. It's uh, you don't have to worry about that. Only breeders worry about that kind of thing. <laughs> right. Okay. So then there's another one was um, like what is tipping the blackberry when it, which I think you did in the scent, um, which would be during the summer time. Yeah, so during the summer that you want to tip the primocane of the blackberry. So you want to tip it about um, two or three times, maybe the first time about two to three feet, um, four feet at the latest. Um, when it you know gets fairly high, what you tip it because you want to stop it from continuing to grow through the season and get really tall. And once you tip it, you release the uh, you you uh, release the apical dominance and the buds. 
below that tipping point will actually break and you'll have a lot more lateral growth than just the upright growth. Okay, and then someone has um, a question. They're new to gardening and new to the area, and they wanted to know if black raspberries grow in Durham. Yeah, I think there is. So um, a colleague of mine, Jim Bellington, who was retired a few years ago, so there is some black raspberries. There's a patch on I-40 um, near the airport, I believe. <laughs> and there's also some in East, lots of black wild black raspberry in Eastern North Carolina as well, and some in the mountains. So, and you know the difference between a blackberry and a black raspberry is that center part there. The torus um, is uh, in inside the black raspberry. It's it's intact, so it's uh, the the center is full. It's got a um, the receptacle is in there, and a black raspberry will separate from the plant. You'll have a hollow core in that fruit. Okay, um, and I think that's all the questions for now. So next up, we have um, Bill Klein to present on blueberries. Thank you, Gina. Sure, you're welcome. All right, thanks, Janelle. Well, let me uh, share my screen here. And increase the size there. There we go. Okay, well, uh, thanks for the invitation. We're, we're gonna talk next about blueberry site selection, uh, establishment, and some cultivars. And uh, just want to mention these talks are available at smallfruits.org. Uh, Gina mentioned a uh, agent training uh, series of um, uh, YouTube videos that was produced on blackberries. Uh, we also did blueberries in uh, 2019. So if you want to see these topics um, broken out by uh, particulars, there's one video on pruning, there's another one on irrigation and freeze protection. So a lot of good information out there. So uh, blueberries are a vaccinium species. They're in the heath family. They're related to azaleas and cranberries. They're, they're an acid loving plant. So they have to have a low soil pH and that's gonna be different from most of the things that you'll be growing. Uh, they're a multi-trunked bush, woody perennial. So they drop their leaves uh, in the winter time and they do require winter chilling. We've had lots of cold weather this winter, lots of chill hours. So uh, blueberries should uh, leaf and flower normally this year. They are pollinated by insects and picked by hand or, or by machine. And if you take a look at uh, what they look like uh, in different seasons, uh, we're in winter time now, just transitioning to spring. So, so still no leaves, uh, the flower buds that you see in the uh, upper left are, um, are starting to swell and that's going to be where the flowers are produced. Then in spring, you see the, the uh, white blossoms there. Uh, then uh, of course, fruit in the summertime and then fall, uh, they have this uh, fall color and then the leaves drop. But uh, I want you to notice in the fall picture, the flower buds for the next season are already forming on those twigs. So you're already starting to reach your crop potential for the following year. And that has implications about how you prune as well. So with blueberries, you want to keep those uh, flower buds that formed the previous year, carry them through to the next season and uh, produce your fruit on those, on those branches. So here's a couple of good blueberry sites. One's in Ashe County in the western part of the state and the other's in, in Bladen down in the uh, uh, main blueberry production area. And uh, what they have in common is uh, a combination of factors. It's good drainage, uh, soil aeration, a uh, low soil pH, organic matter, and an irrigation of water. So the pH for high bush blueberry should be around four to five for rabbit eye, four and a half to 5.3. So that's really low. Not much else will, will grow and be happy in, in a pH that low. You'd like to have organic matter either naturally or by what you add. And a real important point with blueberries is drainage. Uh, if they're growing in the Piedmont, for instance, and you're on the sort of the Piedmont red clay type soils, you really have to be cognizant of this and do everything you can to keep the, uh, the root zone aerated. And this is usually by planting in a bit of a raised bed and adding some uh, 
soil amendments like pine bark to the site before you ever plant. So we'll go over some of these uh, and I'll show you a few pictures. Um, this is what the blueberry soils look like uh, down at the coast, Bladen and the counties around Bladen. There's about 10,000 acres of blueberries in the coastal plain and they're commercially harvested and shipped. And so that's our big blueberry industry is is uh, in that southeastern part of the state. And the soils are uh, organic sand. So they're sands uh, with organic matter. And as you see in this picture, it's, uh, it's white sand and black organic matter, very little brown color to the soil. Now, if you go out in those fields and dig a hole, you hit water uh, pretty quickly. So the water tables within 12 to 24 inches of the surface and the fields are bedded up pretty high to, to improve that uh, aeration in the root zone. Now, this is not the situation we have in most of the state. So when you think about what blueberries really like, this is it. So how do you, how do you imitate this on other soils? How do you create this situation so your blueberries are, are happy? So what you would typically do is on an upland site, uh, like you see here, uh, you would add bark mulch to the soil and till it in to provide a substrate and to help lower the pH. The bark is around 4.5 pH and the beds would be 12 to 18 inches high. And so it's a, it's a fair amount higher than the aisles between the rows. The basic steps that I take when I'm putting in a new, blue, new blueberry planting You'd like to have a well-drained site, full sun. I know we say that for, for every crop, but uh, full sun is, is really desirable. Uh, we're going to acidify the soil, which is different from blackberries. Uh, I'd like to see you have your soil tested and uh, adjust the fertility levels uh, according to the soil test results. Get the correct species of blueberry. We'll talk about that. Uh, acidify the site, mix and mound in the amended soil to form raised beds. And then you're planting uh, dormant bushes in February and March. Now, when I plant a blueberry bush, I usually prune it at the time of planting. So I'm only keeping a few upright shoots and I'm cutting them back one half to two thirds. And we're doing this to remove any flower buds that, that uh, might try to produce fruit in that first year. You don't want any fruit in year one. You spend all your energy growing bush. Uh, would love to see blueberries irrigated in those establishment year. That's a, a really critical thing uh, when, the, when the bushes aren't well rooted yet in the new site. And would like to see a weed and grass free zone around each plant. So uh, even if you don't do a full row, just uh, uh, an area, you know, the size of a wash tub around each plant that you're not going to let any grass or weeds uh, grow in. Some other things to think about, uh, if, the, if the soil is hard to dig in, you may have to uh, do some deep plowing if it's, a, if it's an agricultural site or some deep digging and refilling of the hole uh, for, for good root penetration. Uh, weed control, pH, mulch, all these things uh, may be a lot easier to do before you plant. So if the pH isn't right, I would spend a year adjusting the pH with sulfur and pine bark uh, mulch and uh, try to get that right before you plant. Sulfur for pH lowering is a, uh, is a biological reaction, not a chemical one. So it takes time for bacteria to break down sulfur and, uh, and reduce the pH on that site. Uh, things like drainage, the raised beds, you really can't build the beds after you've planted. You have to go ahead and have that all prepared so that they're at the finished height uh, that you want before you, uh, before you plant. And one question we'll frequently get is about row orientation for sunlight. And for blueberries, I really think it's more important to orient rows for drainage uh, rather than for optimizing uh, uh, sunlight exposure. So uh, really spend a, a lot of time trying to make sure that I'm not trapping water anywhere uh, behind the rows or, or in low areas in the field. When we uh, plant blueberries, uh, at our research farm in Castle Hayne, which is where I, I work down near Wilmington, um, we want the bedded area to be to be raised and also fluffy enough that we can plant with our with our bare hands. So uh, you'd like to be able to instead of having to chop around with a shovel and, and sort of make your hole, you'd like to have the bed prepared so that you can 
pull the soil back with your hands and plant and, and do everything with hands. Um, the little motto there, start clean and stay clean, just refers to using disease-free plants. There's, there's plant material out there that, uh, that is um, uh, clean, and then there are opportunities to pick up uh, material that maybe has viruses. Uh, so I would go to a reputable nursery and, uh, and, and buy plants that are true to type. Uh, I think the, it's less of a problem with the blueberries than it is with the, with the cane berries. But uh, just keep in mind uh, as, you, as you buy plants, uh, you, you get what you pay for. Um, we typically, uh, on, in a commercial field, will set a few extra plants because we tend to lose a few over the first year. Um, home garden situation, that may be not be such a big deal. Um, I like to use um, uh, weed matting or plastic uh, fumigation uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a previously planted area. Uh, not so much for, uh, for small plantings or homeowner plantings, but the, uh, the weed matting is really nice. And that's the um, woven uh, weed mat fabric that you can buy even in, in small quantities like at the uh, big box stores. If you know you're planting someplace that has a lot of weed pressure, uh, a lot of weeds are gonna be coming up, go ahead and use a, a weed mat material. And I think for the year of, of establishment, irrigation is, is just essential. Uh, this is what, uh, what your planting uh, should look like or may look like in the Piedmont of North Carolina. This was a really well-prepared site. Uh, they uh, built these beds up, amended them with pine bark, and then on the surface used a shredded wood mulch. And this planting has taken off and done wonderfully well. There's a, a drip irrigation system there as well, and that was really critical during establishment, but not so critical later. Uh, we get enough rainfall that once the bushes are established, you, uh, you rarely need the irrigation after that. A few tricks about uh, culture and management. Uh, blueberries do have to be uh, pollinated by insects. If an insect doesn't visit, visit a flower, then a berry will not form. So they're, they're strongly correlated with, uh, with pollinating insects as far as your, your fruit set. Uh, you should plant more than one cultivar to get cross-pollination. It'll give you bigger berries and more of them. Uh, if you have uh, a, a pollinator variety uh, or just a mix of varieties. We'll talk a little about pruning. Uh, that's an annual task. Uh, uh, we've mentioned irrigation already and I'll, I'll have a little bit to say about uh, fertilizer and, and organic matter. Uh, we've talked some about the pine bark and the, the low pH, but I'd like to, to mention uh, fertilizer as well. So uh, just a shot of some blueberry flowers. They are urn shaped, sort of like a closed end uh, bell. And uh, the pollen's fairly heavy. So it tends to just fall right out and not self pollinate. So you do have to have an insect visit the flower, get the pollen on their body and carry it to those uh, stigmatic surfaces that you see the, the little pistol sticking out the center of the flower. Uh, that's where the pollen has to be deposited in order, order to get uh, pollination. So insects are, are critical. If you don't get a berry pollinated, then uh, they, they tend to fall off two or three weeks after bloom. So what you're seeing in this picture here, uh, we have some berries that were successfully pollinated and they're starting to size up and, and, and start to look like blueberries. But there's quite a few here that are going to fall off and they're sort of uh, red faced flowers or, or, or berries that didn't get pollinated. And sometimes the uh, pollination is poor. You'll just see the ground covered with these uh, after bloom. So really have to have uh, uh, good pollination uh, in order to set a crop and you really have to have the insect pollinators to achieve that. Now, if you look at the uh, blueberry root system, uh, it is a fibrous mat that's right underneath the plant. And so it's, um, let's see, so it's, it's not a tap root. It's not roots uh, stretching out all across the, uh, the field. The root system's right there beneath the, the bush. So you can amend the site successfully in a fairly small area and, and get everything just right, right under the plant and, and that'll be uh, sufficient. Now the, the soils in North Carolina really vary a lot. So when folks ask, um, how do you fertilize blueberries or what fertilizer should I use? I go right back and say, well, you have to know what 
what your soil has in it and what your soil needs for blueberry. Here are two North Carolina soils. Uh, one's a black peach soil in the coastal plain and the other is a Piedmont red clay. Very different in appearance, very different in, in characteristics. So the uh, peach soil has high humic matter naturally. You don't have to add mulch to it. pH is already low. It's got good internal drainage. The, uh, the clay soil uh, often has poor internal drainage and a low humic, humic matter. So you have to mulch that soil uh, to grow blueberries. And if you look at the, uh, the nutritional uh, content of these soils for blueberries, uh, look at the uh, numbers in that red circle there. The, uh, that's uh, pounds of each uh, nutrient that's needed per acre. And nitrogen, we have 30 to 60 pounds required, uh, phosphorus 50 to 70 pounds, and potassium zero to 20. So uh, that's for that, uh, that peach soil, that phosphorus is limiting, that, that middle element, the, the P2O5. And if we, uh, if we take a look at the bottom nine line of numbers on this slide, the soil classification is organic and the humic matter content is 10 plus. So really high humic matter uh, there, that's a, that's a good natural blueberry soil. If you go over to about the middle of the slide and look for pH, the pH of that soil is 3.7 naturally. So it's a very acid soil. Now, if we take a look at, uh, at the Piedmont uh, soil, the, the sort of red clay soil, a uh, very different picture here. If you look in the red circle, uh, the nutrient needs for blueberries are mostly just nitrogen. That, uh, that second line, the blueberry M or blueberry mature, 30 to 60 pounds of N and phosphorus is sufficient and potassium is sufficient. So uh, the soil test that you send into the North Carolina Department of Agriculture uh, is really critical for blueberries to, to know what sort of fertility program you need. Uh, if we take a look at the characteristics of this soil, the humic matter is not 10 plus percent, it's less than 1%, 0 0.66. So this is a soil that you would definitely have to add organic matter to, to grow blueberries. So again, fertilizer applications is based on your, your soil test results. We start fertilizing at leaf pout in spring, so uh, about April, and stop fertilizing in mid to late summer to let the plants uh, harden off. Uh, drop down there to, to uh, end requirement and uh, sources. Uh, urea is a good, uh, good source of nitrogen for blueberries or ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate will also help lower the pH a bit. I don't know if, if any of you have looked at the web soil survey, but it's a really neat uh, app that's available online uh, from the USDA NRCS. And you click the green button there that says start web soil survey. You can type in your address and you'll see a, a satellite image of your yard or your farm. And you can mark the corners of your property and tell the app to to map the soils and it will tell you what your, what your soils are. So just a really neat um, application that I use quite a lot uh, uh, everywhere in the country. So if, if someone uh, in, in another state calls and they can give me their address, I can take a look at their soil types. This is a, a slide I like to show because it, it illustrates the, uh, the, the raised bed uh, principle that's so important for, for blueberries. This is a planting in uh, coastal South Carolina, uh, not a what I consider a blueberry soil. So it's a mulched amended site, but you can see that deep shadow between the rows where they've really got the rows up, up on a raised bed. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of woody plants, a lot of woody ornamentals require this same sort of uh, bed preparation. If you think about uh, the plantings, uh, for instance, around the bank where you, where you go do your banking or around the fast food restaurants, uh, it's all raised up above the curb. It's all a, a high bed. And that's just a, a really good practice for, for uh, woody perennial plants. I want to say a bit about bark versus wood chips because pine bark is the preferred material. The, the white wood chip material from the interior of the tree tends to tie up the nitrogen. So 
the pine bark is our preferred material for mixing with the soil. If you do use the wood chip material, the white wood, just use it on the surface. Don't mix it in with your soil. And just another shot of, uh, of some of the principles. It's nice to look at these commercial settings and, and see what they had to do to make the uh, site uh, productive for blueberries. And you see these are on raised beds, amended with bark, and then some sawdust looks like uh, additionally on top of the bed. So lots of amendment to, uh, to try to uh, have a good substrate for those roots. This is another shot from uh, coastal North Carolina. It's a pick your own. The soil is amended with pine bark and then the beds are covered with, uh, with black plastic. So again, they're raised higher than the, uh, than the aisles in the middles of the road. Same sort of thing here. This is a, a rabbit eye blueberry planting amended with pine bark under plastic. So just a few pictures to show you sort of the, the, the trends and how you should uh, repair the site. Uh, another shot, this is uh, bearing uh, rabbit eye blueberries, a very uniform and productive stand. This is uh, in the Piedmont uh, of North Carolina and uh, again, raised beds with, uh, with a plastic covering. And another shot, uh, this was uh, in the Netherlands, uh, just a sort of a worldwide trend here on, on uh, soils that have to be amended, where you uh, amend the soil and uh, build these raised beds and, and plant in that raised bed. Another similar situation, this was South America. So that's where our berries are coming from uh, this time of year is the, uh, the Chilean fruit. And I include this picture just, just to show that uh, if you feel like you really have a inhospitable site or blueberries aren't doing well, you can pile pine bark right on top of the ground and grow them in bark beds. And if you can keep them uh, aerated and moist, then they'll, they'll do quite well. So they, they do really well in, in pine bark. So just to reiterate some of the, some of the common mistakes for, for uh, folks planting blueberries, uh, poor site prep, uh, lack of raised beds, lack of irrigation, uh, uh, pH problems, uh, the wrong species, and pruning. We'll, we'll talk about uh, the need for, for pruning and show you some pictures of that. Uh, what you see here, intervenal chlorosis, this is what you typically see on the leaves uh, when you plant your blueberries without uh, without first adjusting the pH. You get this iron chlorosis, iron deficiency, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not iron deficiency. It's just uh, the soil pH is too high for blueberries to, to take up the iron. So the way you correct this is not by adding iron, but by lowering the pH. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about raised beds, and this is why. Um, these are not raised beds. They're uh, on a bit of a slope and there's a dip in the middle of this field. And you can see the bushes are really struggling uh, through the center of the field. And uh, what was striking to me is that the bushes on the ends of the row closest to us, where there's a little bit of slope and they're closer to a ditch are doing much better because they're getting uh, some good aeration there and good drainage at the ends of the road. So, <coughs> excuse me, so this could be corrected by having, uh, having raised beds uh, throughout the length of the row. Um, same sort of thing here. You see really, uh, <coughs> excuse me, good growth in the foreground and in the far background, but there's a swath through the center of this field that's just staying too wet. It's just, just not uh, bedded up high enough and uh, row orientation is off. So, so the bushes are struggling in the middle of that field. So really strive to, to get them up on a, a higher bed. Uh, most of the irrigation I see in the coastal plain is, is overhead. Uh, most of what I see in the Piedmont is drip because it's, it conserves water so much better. So uh, where drip systems go in in the Piedmont, sometimes it's a, a double line like this, uh, sometimes a single line with, uh, with emitters uh, at each bush. So you can see the wetted zone under that uh, plant. So it doesn't take a, a tremendous amount of water just, uh, just directed uh, in that root zone. Remember that? That blueberry root zone is fairly small. Now, I said earlier when I uh, plant a new blueberry plant, I uh, prune off or rub off all the flower buds. And this is what I'm talking about. The, the uh, diagram shows a new blueberry bush with, with flower buds on it. 
and I just cut it really hard, uh, cut back perhaps half of the height and take off all those flower buds by pruning. And if you do that, and then you grow this bush for, for 12 months, we go from February of year one to February year two, you should see the bush pretty much double in size and it will form flower buds again. That's what all the little dots are on the ends of the twigs. And so uh, we've, we've accomplished our goal of establishing that plant and we've got some vegetative growth and it's, it's increased in size. So we take a look at that bush, uh, February of year two, we're gonna prune it. And notice we're pruning this bush every year, even though it's a brand new plant, uh, there's, there's no sort of honeymoon where you don't have to prune. You prune every, every year, every winter. And so we prune this bush to, to sort of straighten it up, uh, stand it up by, by taking out the low angle branches and the ones that are too far out to the sides and uh, maybe pick a few berries in that, in that second year. But our goal is still to grow bush. So 12 months later, the bush should double in size again. And by February of year three, you're starting to see all different ages of canes growing out of the, out of the ground uh, that uh, three-year-old, two-year-old, one-year-old wood all, all coinciding. Uh, so you're, it's a multi-trunked plant. So if we take that bush and prune it, February of year three, we're starting to keep all different ages of canes coming out of the ground so that as canes age out, there's already a new one in place to replace them. And so that's the goal with blueberries is a multi-trunked upright plant with canes constantly coming in and being phased out over time. And it, it's not as hard as it sounds. This is a, a picture of a blueberry pruning demo that we were doing in Chatham County a few years ago. Uh, and you see the bush that's not pruned and the bush that is pruned. So pretty straightforward. You're, you're uh, opening up that, that plant. You're cutting off the branches that are, um, that are sticking too far out to the side. Anytime you have a, two branches occupying the same space, you take one out all the way down to the ground. And, and so these cuts are right down at the, right down at the ground level. And uh, uh, again, pretty straightforward. You just have to be, uh, be fearless and go ahead and, uh, and cut. Now, a little bit about uh, cultivars. Uh, I give this talk all over the state. So uh, we'll talk about some that you don't want as well as the ones that you do. So the Southeastern Coastal Plain, most of that big commercial industry is Southern high bush cultivars. These are not what you want to grow in, in Durham County. So uh, where you see, uh, see these, these names, uh, you may see these in big box stores. Uh, you're not after a Southern high bush. What, what I would uh, like to see you grow is called a rabbit eye. Uh, now these are high bush cultivars and, uh, and therefore the mountains and really well-drained soils and the foothills, again, not, uh, not Durham. So what we're after is, is the rabbit eye species. And uh, this is a very tough uh, native um, uh, to uh, um, Alabama, North Florida. And uh, it's, a, it's a quite a vigorous species of blueberry and these cultivars have performed really well in the North Carolina Piedmont. So we have a lot of confidence in uh, varieties like Premier, Powder Blue, uh, Brightwell uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Piedmont. Uh, some of the newer ones that I, that I really like, uh, Columbus is one uh, in, the, in the bottom group that we're calling newer cultivars that I typically recommend. So uh, uh, plenty of good, good cultivars, but I would stay with the, with the rabbit eye species. Now, when you pick blueberries, uh, we'd like to see the berries hand harvested using a shallow container. So uh, what we typically see in the commercial industry is one gallon buckets, and that's about as big as, as uh, a container as we use. And you can tie that to your, to your belt to leave both your hands free for, for picking. They're not thorny, Gina, so it's uh, uh, much easier going. Um, to maintain quality and reduce rots on blueberries, they're not as perishable as the cane berries, so you can wait uh, to pick every seven days or so. The key to having good quality blueberries is to pick all the blue fruit at each harvest because they're going to ripen over time. And when you go to harvest blueberries, there'll be some that are still green, some that are blue. Pick all the blue, leave the green, and then come back seven days later, do that again. It'll be um, four or five trips uh, four or five weeks before you pick all the, the ripe fruit. 
you want to handle it dry. You want to uh, avoid picking fruit when it's wet. Most of the decay that occurs on blueberries is at the stem scar, and that's only exposed once the berries are picked. So that tells you that if you handle them dry, you're not going to have, uh, have the decay that you would get handling wet berries. Now, I'm going to stop there. I think I'm out of, running out of time here, but I would say uh, this talk and lots of other blueberry topics are available with audio, if you want to listen to me anymore, at uh, smallfruits.org. And uh, so the blueberry pruning talk in depth and, and so forth is, uh, is available there. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing now and... Uh, Actually, Bill, over. before you do that, um, someone wanted to have you go show the um, screening where you pruned again. So they wanted to see that particular slide. Okay, so we're going to go back to... That one, I think. Right in there. Yep. Okay. So what that looks like. And someone else, um, similar question in pruning, is if they're growing in pots, um, maybe because they're, they're holding them for a site um, that you know they got them and they're they're holding them to wait to prep a site and they're aging in the pot and growing for a whole year in that pot would the next year be considered that they would be second year and would it would you need to take off the flower buds at that point if they're growing in the pot mm. you know if they if they spend a year in the pot there there's a good chance they're going to be pot bound and um so you're going to have to uh, really break up the root ball when you take them out of the pot. And uh, when you do that, you, you're still going to have to really do some severe pruning on the top of the plant. So it's almost like you're not gaining a year at all. Uh, so I would, I would, uh, I'd have to look at the plant, the individual plant to see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether you gain anything by leaving it in the pot, but a year in the pot is a long time without sizing up to, to another uh, pot size for for blueberries so if they so, were in uh, like let's say a two or three gallon mm -hmm. pot would that be okay or is that something where they'd still get pot bound i it depends on how long they've been in it and how big they were when they went in the, the pot i've seen some terribly pot bound uh, big plants that uh, really had to be pruned hard and the root system really sort of chopped up to to get them to start growing again it, oh, okay. it, it stunts them so if you uh, knock them out of the pot and that, that medium in the pot is still fairly loose, the root system is still uh, pliable and you can spread the roots out, then you've gained something there. Uh, but if, if they're pot bound, then you're going backwards. So just, just okay. be aware that, that they can't stay in the pot forever. Yes, that, that would be important. I would say, so someone else has a really great question. Um, she, she has um, a bunch of pink lemonade bushes Okay. Um, and wants to know if they're a gimmick or if they will produce. Yes, and yes. <laughs> okay. They, they are uh, they are pink fruited. Uh, they have a, a nice flavor. Um, they're they're sort of unknown in the marketplace as far as selling berries to someone else. You know, there's no there's really no pink fruit on the market, uh, but they taste like blueberries. They're they're uh, productive and uh and it's a fun it's a fun variety to grow it's just not a there's no commercial uh call for it but i could see in a home garden it would be a hoot to have and and if you had a small pick your own that would be fun to um to have something that not everyone has so uh, they're 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 worth growing uh for the novelty uh and they are a, a vigorous and productive plant Okay. And one, one last question came in um, that the roots are showing on the top of my blueberries. What should I add um, to recover um, just pine bark or a combination of pine bark and soil? Yeah, you can just use uh, pine bark, uh, pine needles, wood chips, just almost any uh, material to cover those roots would be, would be fine. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have soil, that's, that's fine too, but uh, typically see just uh just whatever the cheapest mulch material is um, uh, and something that's, that's going to be neutral or, or acidifying uh, over, over time. So a lot of what I see is this wood chip material like the tree companies have that's, that's uh, pretty inexpensive to, to buy and, to, and can use, use that for a surface mulch. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bill. You covered a lot. Oh, it's great. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I'm sorry uh, I didn't spend more time on the pruning if that's an interest, but the 
the pruning video on the website is really comprehensive and, and with audio. So I encourage you to go look at that if you have uh, pruning questions. I'll grab it and post it in the chat for everyone. Okay, super. All right, now we just need you to stop share now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. So up next is Mark Hoffman. Um, Dr. Hoffman will cover strawberry. All right, let me share my screen with you guys. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Mark Hoffman. I am um, the strawberry and grape specialist at NC State University. I'm here now for three years. This is my fourth season. So I'm the youngest among all the speakers here. And I have been asked to talk about strawberry cultivars and uh, production cores. So I hope we can cover this in the next 30 minutes. Before we start, I would like to say that we do have a, the absolute specialist in strawberry cultivars actually on the call, but because Gina Fernandez is not just the blackberry breeder, but also the strawberry breeder at NC State and has more than 20 years experience. So um, we will talk a little bit of cultivars, but if you have questions, um, I would be happy to give that as well, also to Gina because she's really the person who is developing new cultivars, strawberry cultivars here at NC State. Um, so before we start, I would also like to share some resources with you. Some of them were already shared. Uh, we do have a strawberry portal and, and, uh, at NC State, which is pretty lively. And we do give updates on uh, things like frost protection, for example, which is coming up now. Um, and we do also have a diagnostic key where you can look at your um, plants. It's a very nice tool. To, uh, you can look at your plants and they have pictures and you will be guided through uh, uh, a picture guided diagnostics. Uh, the Strawberry Association uh, is also, has also a lot of resources for members, um, always a good place to go to. And if you grow strawberries uh, for a longer period of time now, you, sh you, you should consider to be a member of that association as well. And then as, as Bill said, the Small Fruits Consortium homepage, that is a very, very good resource, always building up. This whole thing looks like this. There are a couple of different areas which, which you can look at. Some One of those which I would like to highlight are the IPM and production guides area, which we constantly update as well. Um, and then there is a strawberry section down here and all those documents can be directly downloaded. Those are PDFs, you can print them out. And as Bill said, there are also other resources like videos and you can look up your regional experts, et cetera, et cetera, on this homepage. So that's a very good resource for everybody to, uh, to look at. So now if we talk cultivars, and this is uh, our homepage, um, to the strawberry growers uh, 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 portal. Um, you can see here we give weather advisories uh, in spring, but we also have a, um, uh, a section which says the NC State Strawberry Breeding Program. And there we have a section where we uh, show um, uh, results from uh, cultivar and selection trials um, uh, at NC State. And, and Gina is doing those trials and, um, and she is um, uh, the breeder, the strawberry breeder, and, and she's updating those information every year. And um, if we talk about strawberry cultivars, uh, there are several types of cultivars, if you want so. Um, the most commonly grown in North Carolina are what we call June-bearing uh, cultivars. Those are the cultivars which usually have um, a flush of, of strawberry flowers um, in April and um, March and April, and you can, you can basically uh, harvest them. Uh, and then uh, until summer. Then another type of cult cultivars are Albion or, or Monterey or Seascape. Those are ever-bearing cultivars. They are characterized by uh, continuously uh, growing flowers um, over the season. That is a little bit restricted by temperatures. And then there are a couple of other genetics which are also grown in North Carolina. Um, and most of them are Florida genetics. Um, we're going to talk only about June bearing today just because of time and because that's the most, those are the most common strawberries which are grown in North Carolina. And then there are two uh, of the traditional workhorses. Those are workhorses, those are relatively old strawberries by old cultivars. By old, I mean they were released uh, in the 80s, 1980s, and they're used ever since here in North Carolina. Camarosa would be one of them, that's a June bearing cultivar. Um, 
and uh, that is one of the larger uh, workhorses here in North Carolina. Um, it's a it's an okay shipper and it's kind of okay with rain. Rain. It's a very reliable producer, but it has a lot of negative tastes the traits here in North Carolina, which we found out over the last couple of years when we were growing it here. Um, the taste can be challenging of this cultivar, especially in the early season. Um, and the large can it can get the large canopy in the later in the season. And often uh, there is a high percentage of, of culls and misshapen fruit, especially also early in the season with this cultivar. Um, but again, overall it produces very well here and, and you can get um, uh, a, a pretty a pretty decent crop out of a Camarosa planting. Chandler is also one of those cultivars which are used for a very long time here in, in, in North Carolina. Um, it can be a very high producer. It has a very, very good taste. And Chandler is one of those cultivars which are more forgiving to grow. What I mean by this is that some of those cultivars which I show, uh, they're pretty prone on uh, planting dates with with Chandler, for example, you can you can have a uh, you can be a little bit more lax on planting dates with a Camarosa. You can't. Um, that will that will affect your your yields later potentially. Um, can, we have a lot some problems with Chandler. It can be very unreliable in berry size. You also can have like a high percentage of of colds, and again, it can get very bushy at the end of the season, and therefore also very high very hard to pick. So now over the last couple of years, a couple of other cultivars were introduced into North Carolina. Uh, Ruby June is one of them, um, which is now more widely um, um, produced uh, with commercial producers in North Carolina. Um, it has a very steady production. Um, so you don't, you wouldn't see like such a big peak like you would see in the Chandler or Camarosa. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. It really depends for who you produce. As you pick operation with like a lot of customers coming in around Mother's Day, uh, you, you might want to have something which produces more around that time. Um, but Ruby June do have a, does have a good taste. It is very consistent in fruit size, and uh, but it can get some white flesh. Uh, depends on, on 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 where you grow it and under which condition it grows. It's, it's been grown. Um, another cultivar which is used more often is Camino Real. Again, also very high producer. It's tolerant to a couple of diseases, which we do have here in North Carolina, and has a very relatively consistent fruit size. Size is very good for shipping or for keeping it in storage. Um, but uh, flavor-wise, it can be a challenge, and uh, it is very susceptible to powdery mildew or to leaf spot. Um, and then Sweet Charlie is an early cultivar. Um, that uh, sends out a very, very early flush. So especially right now, Sweet Charlie would start being the first one which we would see blooms, which means you're gonna have to start frost protection very early if you grow a lot of Sweet Charlie, but it has an excellent flavor and it can send out a second flush if, if you have a good season and you can grow uh, and you do have like a relatively mild spring. Um, again, it's not a big, not a good shipper, but a good you pick uh, uh, option. And again, as I said, because of the early bloom, it can be very susceptible to spring frosts. Another one which I would like to talk about quick is Merced. That's a UC Davis cultivar. Uh, some growers do grow it here. It's relatively challenging because it's a very small plant and it can get a lot of sun and water damage because of the small canopy, but it does have a good flavor. And, and it is really easy to pick because of the small canopy as well. Um, and then uh, two cultivars were released um, two years ago now uh, from uh, Dr. Fernandez um, program. Those are the cultivars Liz and Rocco. And those are the two which, which are the newest cultivars around in North Carolina. They're both bred here under those conditions. And Liz uh, from NC State, is a, they're both very high yielders. Liz has a very good flavor and uh, has a potential shipping quality because it's a little bit of a firmer berry. Um, we do know that they can get some rain damage, um, um, but um, they are all relatively new releases. So we really have to see how they, how they work in, in, in North Carolina and other regions in the US. Um, and Gina can probably talk much more about this than I can really. And then Rocco is the other, is the other cultivar which was also released at the same time. Um, 
It's also very high yielder. It has a very good flavor. Um, it comes on very early. Uh, so it also can be prone to frost damage because of early blooms. And the berry size can be a challenge in this, in this cultivar based on the experience we have in the last couple of years. But again, uh, Gina might be able to take more questions on those two cultivars. Um, if you go into a standard spring production system with strawberries, you know, and, and you want to extend or like, you know, you optimize your fruit, your season, you would have some cultivars which do produce early fruit, like a Rocco or Sweet Charlie. And then you would have cultivars which produce the bulk in the mid season, which would be something like a Chandler or Camarosa, a Liss or Ruby June. And then there are some steady production cultivars like Ruby June or Camino Rara, which, which potentially could extend into the late season as well. Um, so that is what I have on cultivars. Um, uh, I really would also like to talk a little bit about the general production cycle and strawberries. Um, as you can see here, it's relatively, it's strawberries are uh, grown as an annual crop. So, um, and usually the cycle starts here in North Carolina around June with a site selection and, and pre-planned um, uh, preparations. And then transplanting usually happens in late September, early October here in, here in North Carolina. And then depends on the region, sometimes mid-October. And then uh, if, if you're uh, uh, right east, but in Durham, you would, you would plant around the uh, beginning of October, really. And then, um, and then you would have a post-transplant phase where you start to grow your strawberries. You, you plant, your, your aim is there of plant establishment. And then in winter, your aim is to, to have um, the plants go into dormancy. We had a lot of chilling hours this year, especially in January and February, which really, uh, and we had a lot of growing degree days in November. So right now our crops should be actually good to go if nothing really uh, bad happens over, over February, March and April, which is the time when your crop is most vulnerable because you start having uh, flowers growing and you start having um, flowers coming out and you also have a very high chance of frost and sometimes even spring freezes. So we do have a lot of frost here in, in, in North Carolina. And that is one of the actual areas which I'm gonna talk about now. And then harvest would be usually starting mid April, depends a little bit on the weather and then would go through the whole May. And if you're lucky, you would have like a week of June as well. So, that is kind of our typical cycle here in North Carolina um, with June bearing cultivars. Um, this is basically everything I said, just again, like explained in the graph. Um, and then you can see where we are at. Uh, you would plant somewhere around the, the first week of October um, with your uh, strawberries. Um, site selection is really important. Uh, for strawberries, for any crop, it is important, but of course, also for, for strawberries, um, you, I would, I would uh, 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 recommend to have some wind breaks because you can get wind damage if you, especially after new planting and the plants are, are not really established, wind damage can be sometimes very severe on strawberry, strawberry fields. So you want to have like vegetation in the area where you do have, um, which breaks the wind. Also, if you have a pick your own operation, you need to have good visibility, you need to have parking space, and you need to be close to a water source because strawberries need um, uh, uh, irrigation. The row orientation is the most important part is the air drainage and the water drainage. Um, the air drainage that is more if you are in a hilly area, so not that much in Durham, but the water drainage um, that has, so that has to be, that is very important. Strawberries don't like standing water. Um, and then as a third, I would say, if you have good water drainage and you know that, that your air is flowing through, you, through your field, then you wanna have um, the rows in north south direction, but the water drainage is really the most important part. Um, air, strawberries do prefer sandy soils, um, but we do also grow them on like high clay or high loam soil. They, they take a little bit longer, not getting that big of a plant, but uh, they also do that. But the more sandy your side is, the better it is for strawberry. Um, uh, you need to be able to form a six to eight inch bed if you grow strawberries in the plastic culture system. 
system uh, uh, that um, that is more possible if you have less rock content in in your in your soil. So often people pre-bed and then come back and actually form the bed in plastic and strawberries. Um, also important is to apply your your lime. You, know, you apply lime to tar to your to target your pH between six and six point five. Um, that should be done about four months before planting, and it should be on an annual basis. We recommend to, to, uh, to, um, to be on a rotation with sites if you can, uh, and, and rotate every th two or three years to different sites and grow other crops or cover crops on, on the site which you rotated from. And I know that's not always possible, but when you have to stay on top of your target pH, um, uh, even if you don't rotate the site. So taking soil samples, as Bill said, not just for blueberries, also for strawberries, very important. And then and adjusting your pH. In this case, you want to adjust the pH up because strawberries need about six. Uh, so that can is a chemical reaction that can be done with lime. Still takes a little bit of time to do it. Um, soil preparation fertilizer, just very quick. Usually we do have a rule of thumb where we say 60 pounds of uh, nitrogen per acre and 120 pounds of uh, uh, phosphorus and potassium, but it really depends a lot, especially potassium, uh, phosphorus and potassium on your soil test. So you need to look at your soil and adjust your recommendations. There's a very good guide out, out in, uh, from the NCDA, which uh, I have to put the link in, in this presentation that I would, I would highly recommend to look at this guide. It's kind of for free, and it explains a lot about soil preparation fertilization. Also planting space. Um, it depends a little, a little bit on the cultivar. We usually are on a 14 inch planting space that gives you about 15,000 plants per acre. Um, for smaller plants, um, you wanna go on a 12 inch planting space. For example, in Merced, I would, I would grow on a 12 inch, inch planting space and not on a 14 inch planting space. But if you do a Camarosa or a Chandler in Durham County, you should be at, for sure on a 14 inch planting space of plastic. So transplanting, that's really important. Um, uh, uh, most of us are working with with uh, with black plants here in the southeast. That's why I'm why I'm only talking about those today. There are also um, bare root plants available. If you you can order them online or you can talk to nurseries out west, they can ship your bare root plant. But we are mostly talking about black plants today. Very important is that you have a very well developed root ball. The black plant, and I show you a picture in a second. The black plant can look very nice from above. They can have like three leaves, but there, the root ball is not developed, and those are the plant plants which you do not want to want to want to plant. Also important is that the that the crown should be above the substrate of the plug plant, and um, and not inside buried into the substrate. And I can show you some pictures of this how a plug plant should not look like. And you can see here in this area, this is pro this was probably on the left hand side. This was probably like an old. Uh, uh, a runner which was which was stuck and actually sold as a black plant actually sold to me as a plug plant and um and i and and this is all of the this is the whole root ball we just had so this is something which you do not want to accept and do not want to and do not want to plant as well this one is not going to flourish in your strawberry field a little bit harder to see is on the on the right hand side um a little bit harder to see is on the right hand side what, what, first of all, there are two things basically which are a little bit wrong with this. First of all, this is not a um, this is not a very well developed root ball. This plug plant should have grown at least another week or two to like develop a, a nice root ball. A nice root ball, you would see you would see roots coming down here, and you would not see a lot of substrate in this area. And the second part, which is a problem here, is that the crown is buried in the sea in, 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 in the substrate. You see here, this is a substrate surface, and the crown is basically under the substrate. So that is also not in the same on this on this side. So that is also not a, um, a situation, a plug plant, which you do want to plant. Um, and then if you have a plant plant, it's also important that you plant it correctly. That's one of the major reasons why a lot of strawberry fields don't work uh, after planting. Um, you do not want to plant them too deep, so you don't want to put your ground under under the surface. But you also do not want to plant them too shallow and have root systems stuck out 
both of those situations can cause to, to uh, severe uh, 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 dieback, sometimes even uh, uh, die off as the dead of the plant. So you really need to make sure that you cover the root ball, but you do not cover uh, uh, a good portion of the crown of the strawberry plant. That is very important during planting. Planting material, also important. You do want to find a nursery that receives the plants from virus from virus free larger nurseries, which are usually situated in Canada or California. So the way that works with plug plants is that the, the distributors, which you find here in North Carolina, which sell plug plants, they usually buy their own, uh, uh, which we call what we call runners or daughter plants from a larger nursery, which produce quite a bit of daughter plants. And then they produce the plug plants, which then they sell to you. So you want to find, talk to them and you see where they get their planting material from. You want to find one which comes from a fibrous free nursery. Again, same with all the other plants. And um, also look, as I said, at the planting material before accepting it. And you should, you should accept more than you ordered. Usually most nurseries will give you a little bit more uh, just because they know that not every plug plant is plantable. You should expect about two to five percent of of uh, plants which are not plantable. So you should get two to five percent more. I recommend to get more, five to ten percent, especially in years where we have things like hurricanes coming up, or we have a new disease like we had this year, um, which can probably uh, affect more of your planting. So. Uh, Important tip is after planting, don't walk away and just leave the field there. Um, check on your plants frequently, at least one to two weeks after the planting. You, they need to have water as well. So you need to put water on the plantings as well. Um, you can either do that through drip line, you can do that through a sprinkler, but you need to give them some water in the first couple of weeks to establish them. Also, after that, you want to you uh, probably apply for some fungicides to control Phytophthora and um, remove your uh, crispy leaves. And uh, if you suspect to have a, a new disease, uh, which, is, which is around now for a year, year and a half, there is a fungicide which would work about, around, uh, about this too, but then contact um, the extension service first before, before you do this. And then you need to remove runners before they go into dormancy as well. So that, those are like some things which you do after planting basically in winter before they go in, 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 into um, dormancy. Uh, wildlife can be a problem. Um, uh, deers really like, like uh, uh, new fresh strawberry plants, especially if it gets cold outside. So I would recommend to put a fence around it basically at the time of planting or shortly after that. And here are some of the most important reasons why plants die after, after planting. Phytophthora is, called, is one which can cause damage anthracnose, neopestalopsiosis, and then also things like not enough water, the trip line is broken, or, you, or you're not applying water after establishment. You can have fumigation residues, which, which affect planting. You can have plants incorrect planted, or prep plants were generally weak or not very well developed. So those are all reasons why you might see some die off in the first couple of weeks after planting. So now uh, fast forward to into like spring. So basically now, uh, this this time, uh, it, it's it's uh, it, with the warm weather coming up and all the cold weather we had before. Strawberry blooms are about to break. I expect them to be breaking some sometime this week or latest next week, um, and it's time to protest to protect uh, for frosts or at least have your your ducks in a row so that you can protect for frost if there is a frost, and. Um, and that is usually done by row covers and sprinkler systems. And row covers can be used for a couple of things. They can be used to grow growing to increase growing degree days in November. They can be used to protect from lethal temperatures in winter. So if it really if there is a freeze, but now we would use them to not to do any of those. We, the only reason we would use uh, row covers at the moment would be to frost protect our plants. Um, so now. Uh, this is how it looks like. This is a row cover right here next to like one of our research plots. This is not a row cover right next to one of our research blocks. And, uh, and uh, we usually recommend to have a, a two frost protection measures in place, a row cover and if possibly sprinkler systems. And uh, we also recommend to monitor 
the weather, the forecast, sign up for our sign up for our blog. We do give weather forecasts for strawberries specifically. Uh, if we think that there might be frost in North Carolina, it's in, it's in, in, in an area in North Carolina. And please, every time temperatures fall below 40 degrees Fahrenheit on a clear night, you might be able to see, you, you might get some frost. So you really have to watch the dew points, see, look at signs in your field for potential frost um, on like things like pipes or the grass around the strawberry plants. Usually under the plastic, the plants are a little bit warmer than the surrounding grass. So you would see frost may signs first on things like um, grass or pipes before you see them on the plants. Um, so I want to go only go quick about this, about this there, just to, to make sure that we don't, that we talk about the same thing. There is a difference between frost and freezes. Frosts are usually caused by radiation, so, uh, especially the frost we have in our, in our area is mostly hoar frost, which is, uh, you see water crystals and the, and the, and the plants, and that's when the tissue is like around 32 degree Fahrenheit or lower, and that can cause injury through dehydration. Uh, for example, uh, that again, we're talking about tissue temperature, the outside air temperature can be, can be higher than that. And, um, and um, the same is the case with black frost. The only problem is that black frost only occurs uh, if with, under low humidity conditions and with under low wind conditions. So you wouldn't see any ice crystals, which, which makes it difficult to, to see. Again, um, uh, can happen at air temperatures below 40 degree Fahrenheit. The tissue temperature and the dew point of the tissue temperature is really the important part um, to detect frost. Um, that is different to freeze events, which are, which are uh, events where, where air masses are moved into the area. Those are usually long events. They have higher wind speeds. They're, uh, fortunately, they're in spring pretty rare, but there were a couple of freeze events which were very devastating in spring. and um, and the use of sprinklers in those in those areas and, and during those events is risky. So we kind of summed this up here. Um, during a whole uh, during a normal frost, the row cover is probably the best thing you can do. There are some negative things about row covers as well, um, uh, especially if the blooms are already on the plants and you have a very well developed bloom. So you have a really late spring spring frost. You can and and you have to keep the covers on for a longer time. That that can be a tricky. You also under the covers you have a lot of disease buildup. Botrytis is one of the one, one of the favorites of row covers, and mites can come under row covers as well. And you will have pollination issues uh, there as well. Or we use you can use sprinklers under raw frost as long as you don't have high wind speeds. The sprinkler system is fine. Um, again, problem is that you can put too much water onto the field. You can have standing water into the field, or you can use a lot of water um, over this time as well. So. Uh, most people I know use row covers, but there are some who also use sprinklers, but you're going to have to have one of the two. We recommend to have both installed in the field so that you, if you, if one doesn't work, you still can rely on the other one. Uh, the use of row covers and sprinklers are really only come uh, in combination, really come handy if you do have situations like a frost freeze event or a freeze event. Again, freeze events are very hard to manage. Um, but um, but uh, they're fortunately very rare. Um, so that is a big challenge in spring. Um, sp frost management that can be very labor intensive. Uh, blossoms can be in cut in contact with row cover and that can cause damage. And again, as I said, botrytis, mites, and pollination under cover can be a challenge as well. Um, when do we start to protect? So this year we are, we are, we are, we are coming out of a, of a very cold season. So we would get our first blooms maybe in a week or so from now. And that is when we also start going to, going to protect those blooms because that would lead us into early April for our first, for our first um, fruit. Once you start protecting, you're committed. So that is also there for reason for years like last year where we had where we had bloom on our flowers like somewhere mid February. Um, there were growers which tried to to protect mid February their flowers. And, uh, and it is a lot of work. It's very labor intensive. And if there is, a, if it's too gets gets too cold, or if you don't stop stay on top of it, you lose basically a lot of your flowers. So once you are start frost protecting, you're committed for the rest of the season. That's why we usually want to start not before March. Um, as I said, the, most of the uh, frost protect, uh, uh, 
events are hoar frosts. Here's again another, another uh, stage of development when you need to look at critical temperatures. You see here all open blossoms can get their first, can, can get uh, damaged at around 30 to 32 degree Fahrenheit. That is um, really the tissue temperature and not the temperature of the air, um, surrounding air. Another thing I want, to, I want to talk about quick is spring fertilization because that also comes up now. Um, most people uh, start applying their fertilizer uh, in our region here next week um, when they see the first growth. Um, maybe they're going to wait, wait another week. Depends really a little, bit, a little bit how the temperature is going to be in the next couple of days. Um, but once you start fertilizing, you want to start also the tissue sampling. Um, there's again, this is a link uh, the same link which I showed earlier, there is also a good guideline on, in it where to uh, um, sample and how to sample tissues. We usually send pedial and the most recent mature trifoliate. We do detach those and send those separately to the NCDA um, to get our um, tissue sample, uh, to get our um, nutrient demands of our plants. You should do that uh, every uh, two to three weeks and you should take 20 to 25 plants and take in a block, so either of one cultivar uh, or of your whole field, and it should send it to the NCDA so that you know uh, your uh, nutrition needs. Most of that would be nitrogen. And uh, again, there's, it's more detailed in this, in this guide, which I showed uh, over the bloom growth stage, which is in the first th three to four weeks, you wanna, you wanna uh, uh, be uh, in, a, in a higher amount of nitrogen and then at the end of the season, you want to tune it down a little bit. Um, and we're looking at between five and seven, 7.5 pounds of nitrogen per acre per week on uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the food production um, uh, season. And then I'm just going to show a little bit of damage, uh, which you can see, which you probably see now. That's a lot of cold. This is winter cold damage uh, on the left-hand side that's in the crown. Uh, you can see here this like brown area. Uh, that is if the, 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 the that in that case the crown is damaged, and that is a bad thing because that basically is damage your whole your whole um, uh, uh, plant. If you see damage on the leaves like this here, um, this area here, uh, that is winter damage on the leaves. But as long as your crown is okay, um, your strawberry plant will be okay as well. And um, and then uh, sunburn can, can occur. It looks look like very pink, uh, like it can have pink spots. So if you see something like this, this is not a disease, this can, this can be sunburn. Happens a lot if you, if you do have not a lot of canopy or you have a lot of berries which reach out of the canopy or you are on a too wide planting space. That also can be the case. Pollination issues happens a lot, especially in spring. That can look like this. This is again, not a disease, if you have misshapen fruit, that is often a pollination issue uh, in, in North Carolina. And then water damage, that is very, very common, unfortunately, because we have a lot of rain in spring here. And that uh, gives you like the soft tissue here and those black spots and those berries are not sellable anymore. And uh, our recommendation is to, if you, if you can, and you know there's a, a heavy rain coming, which we do have a lot in, in North Carolina in spring, try to harvest before the rain. Because you most, with most cultivars, you can throw away a lot of the crop after the rain. And then frost damage, this is now. You would see a lot of those black areas here. And those black areas are signs that your, um, that your receptacle was frozen. And those would, not, would, would, be develop, would develop either a misshapen fruit or no fruit, but they're not sellable. So this is what you want to avoid by using row covers and sprinkler that you don't get those black fruit here, uh, black flowers. And um, with that, uh, wind damage. Oh, as I said, wind damage can also happen. Uh, you see that here, it's like a lot of the leaf tissue is basically damaged through too high winds. This is the black spots here. That can, can happen as well. Can also happen after uh, establishment. Uh, also, if you buy your plant material, I forgot to mention that if you buy your plant material, don't, and you have to transport it from the nursery to your field, don't put it into an open bed truck because uh, the, the, the wind, uh, just if you drive it on the highway, the wind will, will damage a lot of those plants 
just by driving it on the highway. So you want to keep it in a closed camper shell or something. And that is all I have to say. And um, I'm happy to take questions. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. We have uh, just two questions. One is, I inherited some strawberry plants. Is there any good way to identify these cultivars? They are an ever-bearing type. Um, or is there really any reason to know the cultivar for strawberry care? Well, my, my best guess would be that it's either Albion or Monterey if it's as an ever-bearing ever type. And, um, if that was the question that, uh, you know, as long as, 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 as it produces berries and, and it doesn't have any disease, then, um, yeah. I... And then I have someone who has a question. Um, they have plants and it's their second year growing with black plastic. They did not remove the runners. Oops. But should we reduce the number of crowns now? Um, they look crowded and there's a lot of red foliage. Okay, so what do uh, I need to know a little bit more of details there. We do have some situations this year because we had a lot of growing degree days in, in November, where we do have a little bit crowded crowns. I would basically say if you have by now, if you have like five crowns or four to five or six crowns on a June bearing cultivar, you should be fine. Um, I would not remove those crowns then. But I would remove the runners for sure, and the red leaves. I wouldn't worry too much about them. That's that's a lot because we had so much so cold weather um, that should go away now. With like with like as long as you have really nice crowns, they're tight. With the new weather, there should be a lot of flowers coming out, a lot of new growth, so you should be fine. Okay. Well, it's because I think they're the second year, and so they kind of really multiplied. So that is so they're second year growers or is yeah the, the second year of growth or the plants are in in the plastic for two years no they've been in there for two years oh yeah no that's not a good idea okay um so take the plants out after the season you leave them now take off the runners get your flowers but then you take them out and then you plant you plant new plants in new plastic um uh, at uh, in in in, um, in fall okay and, and then I'm going to send you another question for you to answer um, about pill bugs and snails. But um, we have one more presenter to, to, to talk. So that is um, Wayne Mitchum. And I am going to let him take it away. Always forget to unmute. Um, my name is Wayne Mitchum. I'm an extension associate with the NC State and I have weed management responsibilities in uh, tree fruit and vine crops and I'm going to talk with you today about principles of weed control in small fruit crops. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the screen. Let me get it in the uh, presentation mode here. So hopefully that's coming up for everybody to see. Um, you know, when you think about weed control and why we want to control weed and the expectations from, from controlling weeds and what we expect to get out of that, the, the primary thing, of course, is going to be the uh, elimination of, of competition. And, you know, competition uh, can come for primarily from, for three different things. Um, you're going to be weeds compete with the crop for water. Um, they also can compete with the crop for nutrients. And... You know, with the exception maybe of, uh, of the more upright crops like your cane berries and your uh, blueberries, um, you know, um, they, they can also compete for light. You take a photograph here on your right of this strawberry plant growing with that uh, chickweed coming out from around the hole that was made where that strawberry plant was, was planted. Uh, no question there's a lot of competition taking place there for, for water and nutrients. And you can see, even see the chickweeds getting large enough that it gets over the top of the crop. And that's when we go to talking about competing for light. Um, now, you know, if you've got a, a crop like blueberries here or cane berries, uh, hopefully the weeds don't get tall enough to do that, in a, especially in an established situation. But in situations where you've got newly planted, uh, newly planted crops, um, you know, weeds can get out of hand and, and something like morning glories can climb over the top of those young plants. And, and just be extremely competitive, like I say, even for light. Uh, there's other aspects of, of weed uh, 
issues related to, to crop uh, and, and why we should be controlled. One is worker efficiency. You know, if you're uh, working uh, employees who are harvesting your fruit or you're doing pruning, um, weeds can interfere with how efficient they are at moving through that crop, doing whatever tasks they have to do. Uh, you know, here's some horse weed that's failed to be controlled um, in, some, in some cane berries. And, you know, that would be a problem to interfere with maybe uh, workers visually seeing berries that need to be harvested. Uh, they would also interfere with any kind of fungicide applications that would uh, intercept fungicide. It wouldn't be getting directly onto the, the crop where it would, you know, need to be placed for maximum uh, utilization of that, you know, crop protect that you would be applying. <clears throat> maybe not so much for, for strawberries and, and cane berries and, and blueberries as in some other crops, but uh, weed management is a uh, part of integrated approach to managing some other pests, you know, something like, uh, well, raspberry crown borer, for example, weeds can interfere with applications uh, where those are uh, control applications are made at uh, drenches directed at the base of those uh, plants. Um, you know, with grape root borer, uh, weeds can be a problem there in, in grapes. Um, but like I say, not to the extent maybe in, in blueberries and, and cane berries and strawberries is in some crops, but it is important in, in, in some crops as far as managing other pests. Aesthetic, if you have a, a pick your own operation or a retail location next to a field, or you know, you, you plan on doing farm tours with, with kids picking strawberries from uh, elementary school, something of that nature, uh, weeds are, uh, are a problem if, if you have people visiting those fields um, and so that becomes an important factor in terms of, of having a, a nice uh, presentable field for, for people to visit and, and harvest or do whatever. You know, successful weed control starts with, with site preparation, um, making sure if you've got any weeds that are going to be going in, especially something like a perennial crop like, um, like blueberries or cane berries, uh, going in and, and taking care of hard to control weeds the year before is extremely important um, because, um, you know, once we make these plantings, it maybe becomes more difficult to control, for example, uh, wild rubus species growing in a, in a blackberry planting. Uh, it's going to be hard to control that if you plant blackberries, you're planting on harvesting there. And, and those wild rubus species uh, do carry viruses in, uh, that are problematic. Or if you've got Navajo variety, uh, they may have orange rust that, that uh, makes them that you, you don't infest in your, your planting there. So um, that's very important with, with uh, strawberries, you know, uh, it's more of an annual cropping system, but to some extent that's also important there. You know, if, if you've got nut sedge in a field that you're planning on planting strawberries into, there are some rotational crops and some uh, herbicides and rotational crops you could use there to take care of, of something like yellow nut sage. Um, control practices have to be timely, uh, irregardless of, of how you're controlling those weeds, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, but they need to be timely. You know, um, if you let a, a weed that's uh, already the size of this horse weed here that's growing in these cane berries, it's not going to be able to be controlled, of course, with herbicide at that point. Uh, that should have been done when that weed was you know, one or two inches tall. Um, if you're going to hand remove weeds, the chickweed growing around the, the hole in this blackberry, that should have been done long, I mean, excuse me, around this strawberry, that should have been done long before that uh, uh, chickweed got to that size. Because now if you try to remove that chickweed, you're gonna, the root system on the, on the chickweed itself is going to, uh, as you pull it up and remove it from the soil, it could actually uh, damage or maybe even uproot somewhat the the plant, the strawberry plant itself. And we need to present, prevent weed seed development. Ideally, we would like to take care of weeds and control them before they go to seed to, to increase uh, the seed bank into that particular field. You know, as far as ways and, and sort of dealing with the, the weed and the ground cover in these perennial crops like blueberries and blackberries, um, you know, typically in the Piedmont of North Carolina, we're going to be looking at establishing a a perennial ground cover uh, that would be located here in the in the row middle between your caneberry or blackberry planting or your your blueberry planting and then we would have a weed free area 
uh, that's uh, underneath that crop to prevent uh, competition and uh, to basically uh, make sure the crop gets all the water and nutrients it needs. The benefit of having a perennial sod here in the row middle is one, it, it prevents erosion. Um, it gives you some ground cover for uh, minimizing soil loss. And it also provides a, a solid ground for equipment movement if you're going through making uh, um, applications of, of crop protectants or if you're making applications of, of fertilizers. Um, you know, the, the grass area is a sod, gives you a little more uh, support, especially in the periods of wet weather. Although the conditions we're experiencing right now, uh, you would, if you're trying to go through there, you just have ruts in your grass and it, would, uh, it wouldn't even help with these conditions. But under most situations, it does give you some added support there for moving equipment through the field. <clears throat> you know, in a newly planted situation, um, and I think it's very important that we we note that with perennial crops, the idea is to grow as much of that plant we can in the formative years as possible. And Bill mentioned this uh, earlier about the pruning and about you know, how you're trying to double the size of that blueberry bush uh, for the first couple of years before you go to uh, producing fruit. And with, uh, with, in order to do that, we have to maximize growth and minimize competition from weeds uh, in those formative years of that planting. Uh, if you don't do that, you're going to greatly reduce the growth of these plants. And you're also going to reduce survivability. And, you know, these plants are expensive, but you don't want to have competition to reduce growth, and you definitely don't want to have competition that's going to result in, in losses of your uh, reductions in your, your plant stands. You know, in, in a blackberry planting, this is actually photographed was taken in the same field. Uh, this was in um, April of, of one spring, and this was the uh, July of the following year. And if you're going to go from a small plant like this to a, uh, a wall of, of leaves and vegetation like this for cane berries with, with fruit on it in about a, a 14 to 15 month period, it's going to take a lot of water, fertilizer, and no competition from weeds in order to maximize that growth. And uh, that's why it's very critical that weed control be uh, a primary uh, concern, especially in that first year, first two years of planting in these perennial crops. You know, you're gonna need at least a four to six foot wide herbicide, or excuse me, a weed free strip. Uh, and we'll talk more about herbicides in a minute uh, to maximize growth and yield. Um, and we've got some pretty significant uh, data that shows that specifically on, on blackberries. Um, and uh, we, uh, I'll go into that here in a moment, but we did some work uh, several years ago, a graduate student did, and it's, this got published where he looked at, at anywhere strip widths, weed-free strip widths from essentially zero to up to six foot wide for, for blackberries. And what he found was, was there was a definite correlation in terms of yield. Um, the wider that herbicide strip was in this case, or the wider a weed-free strip is, uh, the greater the yields were. Essentially, uh, having only a two-foot wide weed-free strip resulted in uh, no real difference in, in yield uh, relative to, to doing nothing at all, basically just, just mowing. And if you look at going from a, a two-foot wide strip up to a, a six-foot wide strip, you know, you're getting more than, they got more than double the yield at this particular location. So, uh, you know, we've got to keep that weed-free strip, but it also must be maintained at a, at a width that's uh, desirable to prevent any kind of competition from what ground cover you have growing in that row middle and that sod area. We did the same thing in grapes. Um, and I know we're not really talking that much about grapes, but uh, tonight it's been focused more on blueberries, caneberries, and, and strawberries, of course. But, but essentially, you know, the same thing with, with sawing grapes, um, where we had the greatest yields, where we had the, the widest uh, vegetative free strip. Uh, we've done the work in um, um, blueberry, excuse me, in, in peaches as well. And it's consistent across all these crops. And essentially, you know, if you're going to uh, maximize your growth in the formative years and maximize yields, 
in uh, later years of fruit yields, uh, having a weed-free strip that's of a reasonable width is, is very important. You know, strawberry weed control is, is somewhat, or strawberries are somewhat different uh, in the fact that, you know, the majority of, uh, by far of our production in North Carolina is done in an annual production system. Um, and you have to deal with weeds around the holes in the plastic. Uh, that's, that's very important. And you also have to deal with, with weeds that are they're growing in these areas between the rows, um, in these row middles, and, uh, and they have to be dealt with as well. Now, most of the production in these situations, they, they put a established uh, ryegrass in those middles to prevent erosion during the winter period. And then the, those middles are come in and, and this grass is killed and, and with a herbicide and uh, prior to, to starting harvest, because some of this grass can get fairly large, especially if you're using row covers. And some of it has to be even chemically mown, uh, mowed uh, with the use of, of reduced rates of, of some herbicides. And broadleaf weeds will come up in these areas with that grass and, and they can be problematic and problematic and have to be killed, like I said, when you kill the vegetation uh, after you move those row covers going into the harvest time. As far as weed control methods and how we control weeds, there's you know a number of different options here, I guess, that you could you can think about, but by far, you know, in, in commercial situations, um, Herbicides is what's going to be used to do that. Uh, herbicides are the most effective. They're the most economical and efficient way to deal with weeds in crops. And uh, that's uh, predominantly why that's, you know, they're primarily used in, in those commercial situations. Um, as far as negative impacts, you know, improper application can result in crop injury. Um, you know, if you're uh, maybe not doing a good job of directing your herbicide because we don't spray over the top of a crop like this. We come in and direct the herbicide at the base of, of cane berries or the, or the base of, of blueberries. Um, you can, uh, <clears throat> if you don't have the proper appropriate rate uh, and you're not have equipment that isn't calibrated and you over apply that can obviously cause damage as well. Uh, so we have to be careful, especially in, in newly planted situations to uh, avoid that from happening. Of course, you can physically remove weeds. Um, that uh, is expensive relative to uh, herbicides for a, a number of reasons. Uh, one, if you're large enough that you, uh, you can use specialty tillage equipment, uh, you know, uh, that is an option for you, but it is very expensive and you have to be a reasonable size. Here's a photograph of some specialty tillage equipment tilling up next to the uh, trellis and, and vines in a, in a grape vineyard. Um, and uh, physical removal also can be very labor intensive if you're using, um, you know, hand removal or hoeing to do that in young plantings, which, which has been done in cane berries. Uh, it can get very expensive, whether that be blueberries or whatever. Uh, hand removal is, is, is uh, very time consuming and takes a good labor source. Um, you know, the, the problem with erosion and, um, excuse me, with, with the physical removal and using tillage, um, that's an erosion concern. Um, and ideally, I think you see tillage used more in more arid climates. Uh, West Coast, you see a little more tillage and, and that's a little more common there. Um, but where we have uh, rolling hills in the, the Piedmont of North Carolina, um, by having tillage practices, you do increase the potential for erosion. It can have negative impacts on soil structure. Um, that's also uh, can be a concern. But probably more of a concern than that is the, the potential that you are going to damage the roots. Um, there have been work done showing that, that, you know, where you till around these perennial crops, you get a, a lot of um, destruction of, of those small fibrous roots uh, that is responsible for a lot of your root surface area that take up your water and your nutrients that are very small. Uh, you destroy those in that top layer of the soil next to the the uh, underneath the plant, and um, it forces those uh, root that root system to to put those lower in the in the soil, and and that's a, a negative impact from terms of being able to make use of small rain events. Uh, if we're putting fertilizers on top of the soil, which we'd have to in a perennial crop, uh, minimize the potential to take care of that, 
and you know your your rooting system your root system is a little deeper and it may impact your proper root aeration as well barriers to control weeds is is another option um, they can be somewhat expensive um and they can be really not very expensive as well uh, when you go talking about black plastic mulch like we see in in strawberry production systems um so um some examples that include is some examples of that include black plastic mulch like you see in an annual strawberry production system you know people will do that and lay plastic mulch and plant uh, cane berries through it um and rather than having this bar strip and then you planted cane berry planting you would have plastic laid here um you can use landscape fabric and that's what you see here is some work that was being done at uh, i believe at oregon state a photograph from one of their research trials there uh, we were looking at landscape fabric to prevent weeds from, from coming through that. And of course you can use natural mulches. And you know, Bill mentioned that that's uh, gonna be the case when in blueberries, uh, where you put a lot of mulch in your, um, in your row there, uh, where you're planting blueberries. And, and mulches can be pretty effective at minimizing weeds. Uh, you do have to deal with though, eventually there are gonna be weeds that will come through the mulch and, and they may have to be dealt with either with uh, uh, you know, physical removal or coming through with herbicides. And, and even in blueberries, you know, commercial guys who are using uh, mulches for rabbit eye production still use herbicides uh, to control for pre-emergent weed control in those, in those mulches in, in blueberry plantings. A little bit more about herbicide application. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's the most effective, that's what the majority of commercial uh, plantings are, are going to be using, unless they're uh, organic, which um, there's you know not a tremendous number of organic caneberry production, or uh, I don't I don't know about blueberries, but I know caneberries would be very difficult to do that. But um, as far as herbicide application goes, it's very important that that you be able to apply those herbicides with something that can be one uh, calibrated. Uh, so we know how much material you're putting out. Uh, you need to be able to maintain a constant speed in order to calibrate that and maintain constant pressure. Uh, it's also nice to have a, a pump that's gonna have enough uh, flow that you can push your herbicide through your, your uh, nozzle that's being a, that's directing that spray or if in the case of, of strawberries, you're going over the top of the crop um, and have enough uh, volume to um, push part of that material back around into the tank for agitation. So it, it will basically keep your um, products, your crop protectants agitated, keep them from uh, basically uh, settling out in your tank. Uh, you know, tractor mounted equipment is the uh, most effective means of doing that. Uh, there's you know some people use ATV sprayers or, or side to side sprayers, you know, in, in some uh, smaller plantings and, and have, have gotten by with that. Again, you have to be careful there, making sure you get proper agitation with that. Backpacks is a, you know, a real concern. I think uh, it's hard to do a good job of putting out pre-emergence herbicides with backpacks, uh, just because a lot of folks have difficulty calibrating those, maintaining a constant walking speed, and maintaining a, a constant pressure. And um, you know, one, I I get calls sometimes from small growers. Uh, wanting to know how much material to put in a backpack to uh, to treat a certain area. And that's from a standpoint of someone who works with, you know, making herbicide recommendations. Um, that's the call I probably hate getting the most because it's very difficult to, to, to figure out what people need to be putting out in a backpack if they, they're not properly calibrated. And, and that's where you can get into some real trouble with damaging crops, uh, especially if you're trying to put it out by that means. I think we have to keep in mind too that mowing does not provide weed control. I did want to mention that because uh, from time to time, you know, people say, well, what about mowing? Um, and there's been a, a lot of um, work done in some different crops over the years, perennial crops. It's basically shown that, you know, even though you're mowing and you're cutting off the, the vegetation up next to uh, the, the crop, uh, that's essentially no different than doing anything. You're just basically controlling the, the height of that, that crop, or excuse me, that weed or that grass or whatever you've got growing next to the, the plant. 
and you're not doing anything to prevent competition for water and nutrients. And, and that's a big issue in these perennial crops, especially, as well as for strawberries. Uh, we mentioned several times tonight, the uh, Southern Region Small Fruit Consortium website. Uh, and we've got a, you know, for each of these commodities, whether it be cane berries or uh, strawberries or blueberries, or for that matter, grapes and muscadines, uh, we have some uh, regional IPM production guides there that are excellent resources for information, not only for our herbicide recommendations and, and uh, uh, timing herbicide sprays, but also, you know, a complete schedule for dealing with the management of, of insect and disease pests as well. Um, so um, if you got any questions, I'll try to answer them. I didn't get into specifics on rates or that sort of thing with, with three commodities and, and uh, a limited amount of time. But if you've got any questions, I'll uh, attempt to try to answer those. Thank you very much, Wayne. I don't see any in the chat um, at this point. That's probably everyone is uh, ready to go to bed, I guess. With, 